OK, now that we have a little understanding about what phylogenies represent, how do we come up with these phylogenies? How do we discover them? So when we're making a phylogeny or trying to discover it, we use things called synapomorphies, shared derived characters to make these trees. We do not use things called simplesiomorphies, which are shared ancestral characters. So we'll illustrate that here. In our little phylogeny here of these religions, at some point in the history of these two religions, they acquired a trait we can represent as the New Testament, right? So Judaism doesn't use this, um, these two do. So if we were to make a little table here for this trait, do these taxa have this innovation? Catholic and Protestant, yes. And so then this trait would correctly indicate that these two are more similar to each other, more distant from this, reflecting their closer evolutionary history. And that's a synapomorphy, right? That trait arose later during the history and is shared by more than one taxa. So that's a useful trait. It gives us information that would allow us to come up with this diagram if we didn't actually already know it from history. In contrast, imagine thinking about these four taxa here, right? This thing back here was probably very hairy. It was some sort of ape. But if we were to then think about hair in this lineage, this taxon has lost most of its hair, right? Humans don't have very much hair at all. But if we were to then make a table of whether these things have hair or not, well, gorilla, yes, humans, no, chimps, yes, pygmy chimps, yes. Well, this data would make us think that maybe gorillas and chimps and pygmy chimps are more closely related and humans are the more distant one. And that's actually not true, right? This is the accurate history. And the reason why this data gave us an inaccurate kind of representation of the history is because hair is an ancestral character that was in the ancestor and is shared by three out of the four taxa. It's a simplesiomorphy. And the simplesiomorphy would cause us to get the wrong idea about the relationships of these taxa. Right? Simplesiomorphies lump together groups that are not the most closely related. So when we have our taxa, we have our taxa, and we're trying to figure out what the phylogeny for them is, we need to be very careful to make sure to use synapomorphies and not to use simplesiomorphies. When we're making phylogenies, we want to avoid something called homoplasy. So homoplasy complicates tree reconstruction. Homoplasy is our technical term for having the same character state for a reason other than ancestry. And there are two causes of this, reversals and convergences. So let's look at our kind of phylogeny of religions. We can imagine a trait called having a pope. At this point in the history, um, the pope is acquired, right? This religion didn't have a pope, and then it started to have a pope. And then there's a split, and this lineage retained the pope. This, there was a reversal, right? They kind of got rid of the pope again, and modern Protestant religions don't have a pope. So if you were to make a little table here of presence of a pope or not, no, yes, no, you would group together Judaism and Protestantism as more closely related than they are to Catholicism, which is not correct. And the reason you get the wrong pattern here is because there was a reversal, right? Acquisition of a trait, reversal, and loss of that trait. And the same thing happens biologically. Traits can be gained and lost over evolutionary time periods. Convergences also lead to homoplasy. So here's an accurate phylogeny of Sicilians, which are legless amphibians, and frogs, which are amphibians that do have legs, and then snakes, which are legless reptiles, and lizards, which are reptiles that do have legs. So the ancestor of these things um, had limbs, and they have a branch into amphibians, a branch into reptiles. Reptiles diversify. One lineage loses its legs. Amphibians branch. One lineage loses its legs. So if we were to make our little chart here of presence or absence of legs, Sicilians, no. Frogs, yes. Snakes, no. Lizards, yes. If we just had this data, we would perhaps think that Sicilians and snakes are more closely related, and frogs and lizards are more closely related. But that's incorrect, right? Because Sicilians are amphibians, like frogs. Snakes are reptiles, like lizards. And the reason that this data would give us an inaccurate history is because this convergence has happened, right? The same thing has happened here and here. They've undergone convergent evolution. Those limbless states are analogous traits. They're not homologous traits. And analogous traits arise from convergences, and they can often cause it to be hard 
to discover the true phylogeny. So homoplasy is lumped groups together that are not the most closely related. So we have to watch out for this, right? If we're making phylogenies, we have to be aware that reversals can happen and can give us data that would be inaccurate. And we have to be aware that convergences can happen and would give us data that would be inaccurate in terms of figuring out the true phylogeny. So if reversals and convergences are rare in our data, then we can eliminate this error, reduce this error caused by homoplasy just by using lots and lots of characters, right? If we know that reversals and convergences are rare, we can just make sure you use a lot of data and they'll add some noise, but we'll have a whole bunch of other data that does match the phylogeny and we'll be able to go with the majority of the data. And this is actually why DNA data is so valuable because before DNA, we didn't really have nearly as many characters, right? We could look at skeletons, we could look at aspects of anatomy, but we had maybe dozens of characters. But now that we have DNA data, we have thousands or maybe even millions of characters. And although we know that some of that DNA has undergone reversals and convergences, we know that the majority has not. And so nowadays, basically, when we make our phylogenies, we're doing it with DNA data because it allows us to kind of avoid this problem arising from homoplasies. So what are some of the things that these tree diagrams, also called cladograms, or phylogenies, tell us? If this is the history of taxa A, B, C, and D, B and C share a more recent, most recent common ancestor with each other than either shares with A or D, right? So if you look at B and C and you are kind of going back in time, this organism here, whatever it is, is the most recent common ancestor of B and C. Right? If you go back to here, that's a common ancestor of B and C, but it's not the most recent. This thing here is the most recent common ancestor for B and C, and that's um, more recent then when you go back here, that would be the most recent common ancestor for B, C, and D. And you'd have to go all the way back to here to find the most recent common ancestor of all four of these taxa. So this is a technical term you'll see quite often, MRCA, most recent common ancestor. Now when we look at this tree, B, C, and D all share the same common ancestor, right, this thing here. And because of this, we often will term this set of taxa as a monophyletic group, because what they do is they represent the ancestor here and all the descendants of that ancestor, right? So you have one organism here, and there were three splits that led to taxa D and C and B. Collectively, we'll call this entire group monophyletic from one phyletic group, one history, basically. And most modern systematics experts, people who are naming things, feel that the names of phylogenetic groups, right, family, genus, etc., should reflect monophyletic groups. Right? There should be a concordance or a matching up of the way we name things with uh, Linnaeus's system and the evolution that they underwent over time. So here's an accurate phylogeny of lions, cows, hippos, and pigs. And these three things are all termed as artiodactyls. They're in that order. So this group, Artiodactyla, will define as a monophyletic group because we're going to go back to this ancestor and include all of its descendants and also include itself. However, sometimes we prefer non-monophyletic groups. So here is another accurate phylogeny for modern lizards, theropod dinosaurs, birds, and crocodiles. So when we're thinking about reptiles versus birds, well, lizards and dinosaurs and crocodiles are all reptiles. We don't usually want to think about birds as being reptiles. But if we're thinking about the monophyletic group of reptiles, well, we would go back to this thing here, which is a reptile. And all of its descendants would be reptiles, except here's a group that we clearly like, don't think of as reptiles. So sometimes we like to think about non-monophyletic groups. So this is like the reptile and all of its descendants, but not, not these. So such groups of organisms where we're going to have an ancestor and not all the descendants, we're going to turn this a paraphyletic group. So lizards, or reptiles more accurately, are a paraphyletic group. Right? We go back there, there's the ancestor, and we're going to include most, but not all, of its descendants. And in fact, there are three different terms for groups. So monophyletic group is an ancestor and all the descendants, so for example mammals are a monophyletic group. Paraphyletic groups, 
where it include an ancestor and some, but not all, of the descendants. For example, reptiles, which we just did without birds. And then there's a third category called polyphletic group, where we're not going to go to the ancestor. We're just going to try to group together modern sets of taxa for some reason. So we're not including a common ancestor. You may use this term for something like um, flying animals, right? So maybe birds are there and bats are there. Or maybe birds are there and insects are there, depending on what this is representing. The truth is you don't actually see this term used very much at all. It's basically there for the sake of completeness. But you do see monophletic and paraphletic used quite a bit because it really comes into play when we're trying to match up our naming system with our models of the evolutionary history of taxa. So to return to this tree here, this paraphletic group of reptiles, accepting only monophletic groups is an objective way of assigning taxonomic levels. Right? You could have a phylum as a monophletic group within which it would have other, say, orders which are themselves monophletic groups. But if we do that, it forces nestings that are against our traditional notions of taxonomic levels. Right? So traditionally, here's Linnaeus, reptiles were a class and birds were a class. Right? So they had the same kind of level in the naming system. But if reptilia is a class, then either it includes another class, which is kind of weird, or birds can't be a class of organisms, which is also kind of weird because for a long time we've been thinking about them as one of the major classes of vertebrates. So there is this problem where we have a, a mismatch between kind of the way things actually evolve and the way that we would like to name things we have an objective way of doing it here, but it's going to end up causing things that we kind of don't feel necessarily happy with. And this is actually not like a completely solved issue. There are still debates within people who think about this quite a bit about whether we should be naming things based on monophletic groups, whether it's okay for a class to be inside of another class, or in fact other people would argue that maybe we should get rid of Linnaeus' system entirely and basically give like unique identifiers to every species, and then not worry about phylum, kingdom, classes, etc. Just give everything its own unique name and know that these trees exist and use them when they're necessary for our work. Okay, so going back to thinking about what these tree diagrams can give us. If we look at this diagram here, you can see B, C, and D are more closely related. And then A is sort of outside of them, right? Like B, C, and D are a monophyletic group, and then A it's kind of like a sister group. So you see how taxa A is distantly related to B, C, and D. So if we're thinking about B, C, and D, we, we can consider A to be what's called an outgroup. It's outside of the group we're interested in. And so when we have outgroups, they're really useful for learning about the in-groups, particularly when we're making our tree. Because for example, if we're trying to think about the evolution of B, C, and D, A as the outgroup can give us potentially really useful information about the ancestor here, which is the ancestor of B, C, and D. And then we could see, when we look at the traits for B, C, and D, having a sense of what the ancestor looked like by the use of outgroups gives us a better clue as to what may be synapomorphies and what may be symplesiomorphies. Synapomorphies being the ones we want to use to make a tree, symplesiomorphies being the ones we don't want to use to make the tree. So for example, if we're interested in looking at terrestrial vertebrates and figuring out how they're related, and maybe uh, getting a phylogeny of all vertebrates, well fish is the outgroup of terrestrial vertebrates, lungs are an evolutionary novelty that occurs here, fish don't have lungs, terrestrial vertebrates do, so we can place lungs, and all three of them do, so we can place the acquisition of lungs in this part of the phylogeny. Using this outgroup allows us to place the innovations on the tree allows us to get the direction of evolutionary change, and these things are synapomorphies if they're shared, right? Lungs are synapomorphy of all three of these. If we were to think about then hair or something, that would go in there, right? And we know that it goes in there because if we have this outgroup that doesn't have any hair, and then we've got this taxa here which doesn't have any hair, then we know that hair will go there and it'll be a synapomorphy for horses and cats. So when we're thinking about our phylogeny and we're trying to kind of resolve or figure out certain parts of it, the use of outgroups can be really vital to being able to do that.
Sometimes you'll see trees depicted like this, where the branching pattern is, is maybe the same as what we saw before, but sometimes the lengths of these lines are a little bit different. So when you see trees where the lengths are different, where they have different branch lengths, they're representing some sort of um, divergence by the lengths of these branches. So for example here, I'm kind of conceptually and without really rigor, I'm kind of showing maybe change in the way the body looks or something, right? So here's marsupials, and then here's placental mammals, here's perissodactyls, which are like horses um, and rhinos, here's artiodactyls, which are like deer and pigs, and then here's cetacea, which are like whales. Well, clearly whales have changed physically quite a lot compared to their close relatives, which look actually quite similar to each other. So we could maybe think about representing that with a longer branch length here to show the increased morphological divergence. Now in reality, usually these branch lengths are not done based on morphological divergences. They're usually done from molecular data, like DNA sequences or amino acid sequences, where we can count the number of changes, and maybe in a lineage you have a larger number of changes that will give you a longer branch length. So if you see a tree where all these lines end at the same point, that's probably a phylogeny depicting just the relationships or divergent times. If you see a phylogeny with varying lengths, where some taxa are kind of further out and some are further back like this, that phylogeny is also representing the amount of divergence in some sort of trait that they use to make that phylogeny, and that's almost always going to be DNA sequences or amino acid sequences.